Praise the Lord. I welcome you to a reviving and beneficial Sunday worship today in Jesus' name. I praise the Lord for you, for your family, and for everyone around you, and for all your friends that you have invited taking part in this worship service. Today we have something important to inject into your life, and I believe that you'll never be the same again in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this hour. We thank you for this time. We thank you for your love for every one of your people. We're asking you, Lord, that this Sunday worship service will be a reviving time for everyone, a refreshing time for everyone, and power, inspiring event for everyone in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. Help us, Lord, to rediscover and to recover everything we have lost and let the strength of the Lord and the might of the Spirit come upon everyone worshiping with us today in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Today already we have studied from Psalm 8 and from Psalm 9 in our search the scripture session. And this time now I want to look at Psalm 8. And I'm taking some verses out of Psalm 8 and from there we're launching into what the Lord has for us today. But then let me go back to Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1 it says, verse 26, And God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And then it says in verse 27, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he, he, male and female created he them. Verse 28, look at this, and I want you to notice the particular word here, and God bless them, and God will bless you today, and will continually bless you, and God said unto them, be fruitful, you'll be fruitful in every way, spiritually you'll be fruitful. Materially, you'll be fruitful. In the work of your hand, you will succeed and you'll be fruitful in Jesus' name. It says, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Fill up the earth and subdue it. Look at this. And have dominion. And have dominion. You're not supposed to be a trodden down man, a trodden down woman. You're supposed to stand and you're supposed to have backbone and you're supposed to have authority. You're supposed to have dominion. Adam was created. Adam and Eve were created to have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Eventually, I'm sure you know the story. Man fell from grace to grass. Man fell from the high tower where God has placed him and he fell into sin and he lost that dominion. We're coming to Psalm 8 now and I'm reading from verse 4. Psalm 8, reading from verse 4. It says, What is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him. Look at verse 5. It says in verse 5, For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor. In verse 6 it says, For thou madest him to have dominion. You see that? You remember that? We read that in Genesis chapter 1 and in verse 28. It says, now you made him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. And thou hast put all things under his feet. The point I want to make a reference to here is found in verse 4. That question in verse 4 that says, what is man? What is man? You see, as you ask that question, and you are asking, what is man? You have to describe the man you are talking about. You have to define the man you are talking about. Because you see, there was man at creation. What do you know about the man at creation? We're told in Ephesians chapter 4, 
reading from verse 24. It says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24, and that she put on the new man. You see, there's an old man. There's a new man. And so when you're asking the question, what is man? Put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. When God created man, and man came out straight from the hand of the Almighty God, that man was created in the image of God. He was created in the likeness of God. He was created in righteousness and true holiness. So when you say, what is man? We will say, at creation. He was a creature of God, like God. Righteous and holy and godly. But then after man fell, you're asking the same question, what is man? We're looking at man now without Christ. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. Ephesians chapter 2 Reading from verse 12, it says that at that time, it's referring to the time before you knew Christ. At that time, ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So when you say, what is man? You have to define the man, describe the man you're asking of. What is man at creation? He was a holy righteous creature of God. What is man without Christ? Look at verse 1 of this, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, and you will see quaking, who oh, are dead in trespasses and sins. What is man without Christ? It's a transgressor and a sinner. Look at verse 2. It says in verse 2, wherein in time past, you walk according to the cause of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now walketh in the children of disobedience. What is man without Christ? Is the person who doesn't have any control of himself, any power by himself. He is dominated and is run over and ruled over by the devil. In fact, it says in verse 3, look at verse 3 there, among whom also we all had a conversation in times past. Before we knew Christ, we were like the rest of the world. We didn't have any power. We didn't have any dominion. And it says, we are walking the laws of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we are by nature. Look at this. After man fell, the nature of sin then came. The nature of Satan now came. The nature of transgressors now came. And it says, we were by nature the children of wrath. Even as others were asking the question, what is man at creation? What is man without Christ? Let me now come to another point. What is man after conversion? When the Lord has forgiven us and we are regenerated and we are redeemed and we are ransomed and we are purchased by the blood of the Lamb. And it makes us to become a member of the family of God. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we're looking at verse 17. It says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, says the Lord. You see, he separates us. He takes us away from the things of the And then he says, I'll be a father unto you, and you will be my sons, and you'll be my daughters, says the Lord. At conversion, we become the children of God. At conversion, we become the sons and the daughters of God. At conversion, a change it takes place when no more that like Jesus told those Pharisees, your, your father, the devil, and the works of your father, ye will do. But now, you know, we come to the Lord, and as we come to the Lord, we become the children of God. What is a man after conversion? We've seen him at conversion. As God himself said, I'll be your father, and you'll be my sons, and you'll be my daughters. Now after conversion, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, looking at verse 19, it says, Watch, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, is saying that when you come to the Lord, after that conversion, there is a change that has taken place now, and it says, the Holy Ghost dwells in you. It says, which you have of God, and ye are not your own. Verse 20 says, in verse 20 it says, for ye are bought with a price, 
Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's, because you now belong to God. You see, when we ask the question, what is man? You have to be definite and you have to be clear as to what kind of man you are asking about. Man at creation, that's different. Man without Christ, that's different. Man at conversion, that's different. Man after conversion, that's different. Now, man in Christ is born again and Christ has entered into him. If you abide in me and I and my word abide in you, you become totally different. Look at Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, different. It's not a man not without Christ, a man without grace, a man without any foundation, a man without faith. This is a man that is now in Christ. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. Old things have passed away. All the old deformity, all the old deficiency, all the old habits, everything passed away. And behold, all things have become new. Now, what is man with Christ? In Christ, yes, a new creature. Now, with Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. And we're looking at verse 6. Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 6. And he has raised us up together. He has raised us up together. We were crucified with him. We died with him. And were buried with him. And we were raised up together now like him and with him. And he said, he has raised us up together. And made us see together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus when you compare Eden with the heavenly places, heavenly places, that's higher. When you compare the first Adam and you compare him with the last Adam, Jesus Christ, the last Adam is higher and Jesus Christ is greater and Jesus Christ is mightier. And he says now, he has raised us up and we are made to see together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And what is man when he becomes like Christ, when the grace of God so transforms him, and he comes nearer and nearer and nearer unto Christ. And look at this, it tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're looking at verse 18, when he makes us to be like him, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, but we all, with open face beholding, as in a glass, the glory of the Lord. We are not looking at the degradation and the disgrace and the defilement and at the description of Adam after he has fallen. We are not looking at the Lord Jesus Christ with open face beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord. We are changed. Look at that. We are changed into the same image. We become like him. We change into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Even as by the Spirit of the Lord. What then happens to us after we are changed, after we are transformed, and we are like him? I come to Galatians chapter 2, reading from verse 20. Galatians chapter 2. Reading from verse 20, it says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, it says, I am crucified with Christ. I'm identified with Christ in his sacrifice. He was my substitute. He took my place and he brought me near unto himself. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. It says, the old nature is not the one alive in me anymore. It's not the one that is motivating me and is propelling me and controlling me. It says, nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth in me. And I give him the chance to express himself. I give him the chance to demonstrate himself. I give him the chance to live in me the way he wants to live. Because he makes me like himself. He says, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What's the consequence of that in First John chapter 4? First John chapter 4, we're looking at verse 17. First John 
chapter 4, we're looking at verse 17. Here it is, I love me perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. We have boldness in the day of judgment. Why? We're cleared and we're acquitted. Why? Because now he has set us free. Now, he gives us the assurance we're going to meet God on the final day. We're not dropping our heads and we're saying we don't know what's going to happen. By faith, we know what's going to happen. By grace, we know what's going to happen. But the love of God demonstrated for us, for you, for me, on the cross of Calvary, we know what's going to happen. And it says, here in the Son of made perfect, the love we have for God, the desire, the affection we have for God. Here in the Son of made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Look at this, because, because as he is, as Christ is, so are we in this world. The question then, what is man at creation? Now you understand? The question, what is man without Christ? You understand? What is man at conversion? You understand? What is man at a conversion? You understand? What is man in Christ, a new creature? You understand? What is man seated together with Christ in heavenly places? And what is man when he beholds the face of Christ? And is changed and transformed to become like unto him. So today we're considering the message, our recreation and dominion in Christ. Our recreation and dominion in Christ. It takes up anyone that comes, a sinner, a transgressor, an ungodly person, and he recreates you. And he refashions you. And he remodels you. And then he pulls his dominant power in your life. Our creation. Why don't I say your creation and dominion in Christ? I'm talking to you. Your own recreation is going to recreate you. When he reforms you. When he refines you. And when he translates you from that position of weakness. And he brings you to the position of power. It's going to recreate you. Our recreation and dominion in Christ. There are three things we're looking at as we look at the message. Number one, the defeat of trampled souls without Christ. The defeat of trampled souls without Christ. Point number two, the declaration of a transformed state in Christ. Point number three, the dominion of triumphant saints through Christ. When you go through one, two, three, and you come out cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, energized by the Spirit and power of the Holy Ghost, you will never be the same again. Even from this afternoon, after this service, you'll find a new strength, a new power, a new understanding, a new revelation that comes to you, and you're going to start living now at a higher level in your Christian life and in your Christian ministry in Jesus' name. Let's go to point number one. In point number one, the defeat of trampled souls without Christ. Already we have read in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 12, you remember, it says at that time we were without Christ, we were without uh, the God and without hope in this world. But now it says, but at that time, if we look at Romans chapter 5, verse 6. In Romans chapter 5, verse 6, it said, we didn't remain like that. Because even though we're without Christ, and we're, we're without hope, and without faith, but now a change happened. Look at verse 6 of Romans chapter 5. It says, for when we were yet without strength, without Christ, without ability, and without victory, when we were without triumph, when we were without authority, it says, for when we were without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. But let's look at what we were in the past. A day is a section I'm dividing into three parts. Number one, the original dominion of the created man. Number two is the offensive disobedience of the corrupted man. And then number three, the observable depravity, the observable depravity of the common man, of the average man, of the man on the street, of the man, a religious man, but he doesn't know Christ. The observable depravity of such a common man. And let's go to number one. We're looking at the original dominion 
of the created man, that is of Adam and Eve. We're back to Genesis again. In Genesis chapter 1, reading from verse 26, and God said, let us make man, can I stop there and explain, let us make man, that's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, that's the divine trinity right there. Let us make man in our image, our image, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, after our likeness, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. When it says our image, and it says our likeness, it's talking about righteousness. God is righteous. God is good. God is godly. And God is merciful. And God is perfect. And so when man was created, it was in the likeness of God, in the likeness of uh, Jesus Christ. Now, if you have looked at the life of Jesus without sin, without weakness, without fear, holy and righteous, that's exactly how the original man was. And he had that original dominion of that created man. It says, and let them have, let them have the men and the women when they come out of the hands of God, created by him. It says, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping sin that creepeth upon the earth. In verse 27, it says, So God created man in his own image. Have you noticed something here? Let us make man in our image. And now God created man in his own image. That's the unity of God. The unity of God. Try unity. Trinity. Let us, plurality. And now in his own image, singular. In his own image, in the image of God, created he him, male and female, created he them. And then in verse 28, it says, in verse 28, and God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful. When you come out of the hand of God, you'll be fruitful. When God creates you and he gives you the reproductive power, you must be fruitful. You'll be fruitful in Jesus' name. Let me hear your amen. It says, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Subdue it. The earth will not subdue Adam, should not subdue Adam. Adam and Eve shall subdue the earth and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. That's the original dominion. In uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 2 verse 6, it says, But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man? that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man, that thou visitest him. Look at verse 7. It says in verse 7, thou madest him a little lower, not too much lower, a little lower than the angels, and thou crownest him with glory and honor, and did set him over the walls of thy hand. It tells us in verse 8 over there, it says thou hast put all things, that was put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. Then he says, but now we see not yet all things put under his feet. That's talking about the future when in the millennial reign, Christ will have real, literal, practical dominion over everyone and he will reign literally and he will be the king, he'll be the lord, he'll be the one that rules over the whole earth. He said that millennium, we're still waiting for that, but then he says as at now, we see Christ and we're identified with that Christ. And then God gave Adam and Eve, he gave them a commandment that you'll find in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, reading from verse 15. A commandment of what to do, a commandment of how to live. Now that they are dominion and they are the power and they are the ability, God never gives you an assignment. He doesn't give you the ability. He doesn't give you the sufficient power to carry that out. And the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. To dress it, 
You see, man still had a work to do to dress that garden and to keep that garden from intruders that the serpent shouldn't have entered, that Satan shouldn't have entered. And God gave him the supervisory role that he will keep that garden of Eden. Look at verse 16. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden that mayest freely eat. Look at verse 17 now. It says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat. Thou shalt not eat. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. That, that now, what happened after that? The man had dominion. Let us see now. We go from the original dominion and we go to the offensive disobedience in Genesis chapter 3. As you look at verse 6, Genesis chapter 3, reading from verse 6, you'll see what happened. Satan came in the form of the serpent and deceived Eve. And then Eve accepted all that deception and did it. Look at Genesis chapter 3 verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to, to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her. And he did eat. The husband was there. The husband was to keep the garden and not to allow any intruder, any deceiver, any serpent, any Satan to come in. You see, maybe he didn't know that that serpent represented Lucifer. But you understand, he had perfect knowledge at that time. Don't you remember? He gave names to all the animals. All the animals, many of them, all those many speeches, he gave names to them. And when Eve came, that's in chapter 2, I'm referring to, he said, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. He had knowledge. And yet, with all that knowledge, with all that wisdom, and with all that insight, and he was with Eve at the time when the temptation came. And it says, he did eat. And eventually, you know what happened? A curse came. Because when God said, Adam, where are you? Where art thou? Instead of confessing, he gave excuses. The woman whom you have given me, he led me into this. Look at Job chapter 31, verse 33. And see the comment of the Bible, the comment of the word of God on what Adam had done. In Job chapter 31, verse 33, I'm sure you are opening your Bible. If I cover my transgressions as Adam, that's what Adam did. He covered his transgression by hiding my iniquity in my bosom. And so he hid that iniquity, but God discovered. And God said, who told you that this was your condition? And then all the excuses did not allow God to forgive him and to have mercy on him and on Eve at that time. So they were driven out of the garden. We're coming to Romans chapter 5. And you see the consequence of that in Romans chapter 5, looking at verse 12. Romans chapter 5, reading from verse 12. It says, wherefore, as by one man, Adam, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sin. What's that sin? We had that nature of sin. We are born with that nature of sin. Because Adam and Eve had sin, all the, all the children that came through them, they had that nature of sin. Sin passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. By nature, man became a sinner. By practice, man became a sinner. By habit, man became a sinner. And in destiny, he'll be treated like a sinner, except redemption, except recreation, except forgiveness, except salvation takes place. Look at this now, the observable depravity of the common man. It now says all have sinned, and you can observe that. As you look at man in general, in fact, we're going back to Genesis chapter 5, verse 3. In Genesis chapter 5, reading from verse 3, the depravity that came upon 
every man upon the common man. It says, and Adam lived an hundred and thirty years and begat his son in his own likeness after his image. After man fell, he lost the likeness of God. And the image of God, he now had a sinful likeness, a sinful image, a sinful personality. And it says, Adam and Eve now gave birth to children in their own image, after their own likeness. And called his name, said, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. Genesis chapter 6, reading from verse 5. Open your Bible. It says, and God saw the wickedness of man, that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's what man became, because man had fallen, because man has been defiled, because man became depraved. Every imagination of the thoughts of his heart became evil, only evil, continually evil. Look at Job chapter 14, and we're looking at verse 4. Job chapter 14, reading from verse 4. Who can bring a clean sin out of an unclean, not one? How do you see that? It's saying Adam became unclean, Eve became unclean, and they came together. You know, the first child was not born when they were in the state of innocence, when they were in the status of dominion. The first child was not born when they were still holy and righteous, having the image of God and having the likeness of God after they had fallen, after they had been driven out of the garden of Eden. That's when the first child was born. And all the children that were born since that time after the garden of Eden. And so that's why it's seen who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean, not one. In Job chapter 25, Job chapter 25, reading from verse 4. How can then man be justified with God? Man ordinarily. Man that has not known the saving grace of God. How then can man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? How can he be clean? Anyone that is born of a woman. He might pretend outwardly as if he has some self-righteousness, but no, everything is dirty and everything is of iniquity. That's why the psalmist says in Psalm 51 verse 5, Psalm 51 verse 5, and then it says, In sin did my mother conceive me, and in sin was I born. You see, when anyone, a baby is born, in sin is that child born, and in sin is that child conceived. Is talking about the depravity of the man. And he tells us in Psalm 58 and verse 3. Psalm 58 verse 3. And he's talking about the man, the one who does not know Christ. And he says in that Psalm uh, 58, and he's saying from verse 3, that the wicked are estranged from the womb. And they go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. You know what that is saying? Nobody teaches a child to tell a lie. Nobody tells a child or teaches a strong a child. A child does not have to go to school to learn how to lie. It's in the nature of that child. It's the depravity in that child. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking in lies. That's why it says in Isaiah chapter 64. Isaiah chapter 64, we're reading now from verse 6. It says, but we are all as an unclean thing. You see that? Everyone, that's what say this is of the common man. This is universal. This is everyone. It says, but we are all as an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses as filthy rags. And we all do fade away as a leaf. And our iniquities like the wind. The wind is everywhere. Iniquities are everywhere. In our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. It tells us in Mark chapter 7, that the things that come out of a man, the attitude and the action, and the habit that comes out of a man, 
and is observable. Observable depravity of the common man. In Mark chapter 7, verse 21, for from within, out of the heart of men, all men without Christ, all men without faith, all men without redemption, all men without salvation, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, not only lies now that we read about in, uh, in Psalm 58 verse 3, but now evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders. In verse 22, it goes on to say of thefts and thefts and covetousness and wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. Verse 23 says, all these evil things come from within. Come from within. You know what psychologists say? Psychologists say it is the environment that makes a child to behave a particular way. They say, look at that child. If that child is coming out of a home where the, the father is a drunkard, he also becomes a drunkard. While they, when this, uh, the parents are doing this, this is what will happen. The Lord Jesus said, all these evil things come from within, not from without, not from the environment. It comes from within and defile the man because of the depravity of the man. In Romans chapter 7, looking at verse 15, Romans chapter 7, reading from verse 15, is still talking about the depravity of man. It's talking about the sinfulness of man. It's talking about man in his normal state, natural state, and his sinful state. And it says, for that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that I do not. But what I hate, that I do. In verse 16, it says, if then I do that, which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. And then in verse 17, it says now, then it is no more I that do it. Even when I don't want to do it, it's done. It's like the sin is there and then it's generating the evil. It says now, then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. This is a man that doesn't have Christ yet dwelling in him, grace yet dwelling in him, and the work of redemption abiding in him. This is the one that has seen dwelling in him. And then he says in verse 18, in verse 18, for I know that in me, that he is in my flesh, dwelleth no good sin, for to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. In verse 19, it says in verse 19, For the good that I would, I do not, and the evil which I would not, that I do. Look at verse 20. Verse 20 says, Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. And so we have seen the defeat of the trampled soul without Christ. A change is going to come. When that man comes to Christ, a change is going to come. When that man now knows Christ and the power of redemption works in the life of that individual, whether a boy or a girl, a man, a woman, anyone, a religious man, an irreligious man, when you come to God and there's a transformation, if it has not happened already, it will happen in your life. If you have not experienced it yet, you will experience it even today in Jesus' name. And if you have got it already, you are saved, you are born again, and you are a real child of God, as you behold Christ afresh today. New life, a new strength, a new power, a new dominion will come unto you in Jesus' name. Let's come to point number two now. In point number two is the declaration of our transformed state in Christ. The declaration of a transformed state in Christ. It transforms us. And when it transforms us, what happens? Look at Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and verse 2. Please open your Bible. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, 
holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable oh, service. Look at verse 2 there. It says in verse 2, and be not conformed to this world. Don't say, well, it's Adam. It's Adam. Because he fell, that's why I'm filthy. Make a change. Christ has come. After Adam fell, Christ came and he showed us the perfect picture of what man could be when man is redeemed. And he can take the weakness away. He can take the deformity away. He can take the deficiency away. He can even take the depravity away from you. And now you can come transformed by the hands of the Lord. And it says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. When that happens, what will happen? You are recreated. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Let everything inside you, your thought life, your habit life, and your plan and everything, your mind, your spirit, your soul, everything, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And put on, in verse 24, it says, and that she put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness, created in righteousness, in recreation will take place. You are created in righteousness and true holiness. As we look at this declaration of our transformed state in Christ, we're looking at three things. And number one, our true sonship in Christ. Our true sonship in Christ. Number two, our transformed stage in Christ. And number three, our treasured similitude, our treasured similarity to Christ. Look at one, our true sonship in Christ. It's in John chapter 1 verse 12. And it says in John chapter 1 verse 12, but as many as received him, as many as will abandon Adam, abandon sin, abandon transgression, turn away from that darkness and from that dark picture. And you turn to Christ and as many as received him, to them he gave power, he gave authority, he gave the privilege to become, look at this, the sons of God to become the sons of God. You are not like that before, but now you repent. You turn away from sin and you hate sin and you denounce sin and you detest sin and you come to the Savior. It says you become sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. When we become sons of God like that, what's the initial thing that happens in Romans chapter 8 verse 14? Romans chapter 8 verse 14, it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You become a child of God. You are born again. And the Spirit of God takes over your life. You are not being ruled. You are not being controlled. You are not being directed. You are not being led by the old self, by the old life, and by society, and by what you see around as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. In verse 15, it says, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We've turned away from Satan, turned away from sin, and now it becomes our Father. God becomes our Father. And Jesus Christ, our Savior, and the Holy Ghost, our Comforter, and our Leader, and He leads us in the way of righteousness. And now, by the Spirit, we call Abba, Father, Daddy, Father. And it says in verse 16, it says in verse 16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Children of God. And if children heirs, look at verse 17, he said, because we're children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heir with Christ, if so be, that ye suffer with him, persecution, that we may also be glorified together. And as sons of God, 
through sonship in Christ. Look at what that does for us in Philippians chapter 2 verse 14. Philippians chapter 2 verse 14. It says we do all things now without disputing and without murmurings. And then in verse 15, it says in verse 15, that she may be blameless and harmless sons of God. You see that we're different from that Adam now, the fallen Adam, the filthy Adam, the feeble Adam. We're different now from that Adam because we come to Christ and we live in the strength, in the power, in the grace of Christ. And now we're sons of God that she may be blameless and harmless and the sons of God without rebuke. In the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. And says in verse 16, in verse 16, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. He says, we're now demonstrating, we're now shining forth the word of God and the word of light, and we're shining with the light of Christ, so that Paul the apostle and the preachers and the pastors and the leaders will rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Our true sonship in Christ. Now, what does that then translate to? Number two now, a transformed stage in Christ. When you come to Christ, transformation. When you come to Christ, there's a change and there's a newness of life. From within, he recreates us. He transforms us. And things are totally different. And it doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter your background. When you come to Christ, in the real sense, there's a transformed state. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It says, therefore... Because of Calvary, therefore, because of the shedding of his blood, therefore, because you now come to Christ and you are holding on to him as your savior, as your redeemer. And he makes that change and that transformation. It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Let's come back to this, uh, chapter 3 of uh, 2 Corinthians verse 18, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, and it says, But we all, with open face, beholding us in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image. We are changed into the same image. Look at this, from glory to glory. You abide in Christ, you continue in Christ, you're looking at Christ. You're not looking at the example of what you see in the world. You're not looking at those stars and they call them stars in the world on the billboard. You're not looking at the people you hear of in history. You're pinning and you're focusing your attention on just your Redeemer, on Christ your Savior. And it says, as you behold Him and you see His life, and that reflects on you. And that impacts your life. It says we are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Even as by the Spirit of the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 25. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. It says in verse 26 that he might sanctify and cleanse it or the washing of water by the word. That's what he does when we come to him. Number one, he saves us. He forgives us. He takes away the sin. He cleanses up the pollution of sin and he breaks the hold and the power of that sin in our lives. And now he sanctifies and he cleanses us by the washing of water, by the word. And then in verse 27, it says that he might present you to himself a glorious church, a glorious Christian, a glorious believer, a glorious congregation, a glorious assembly, a rapturable church. That he might present you to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That's the transformed stage 
of the believer when it comes to Christ. Now look at our treasured similitude to Christ. Our treasured similarity to Christ. We're looking at Romans chapter 8. Verse 29. Our treasured similitude to Christ. We treasure this. We embrace this. We hold on to this. We believe this. We will not let it go. Like a treasure. You'll not let it go. You'll give up every other thing. So that this treasure will be yours. It tells us over here in, um, in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, for whom he did for no. He also did predestinate, look at this, to be conformed to the image of his son. To be conformed to the image of his son. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That's the desire of the Lord. That's the intention of the Lord. That's the plan of the Lord. That's the purpose of the Lord. And that is why Calvary took place. And that is why redemption has been made possible to make us conform to the image of His Son. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 49. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 49. And as we are born, the image of the earthy. I see. What it means is, we bore the image of the first Adam, the earthly man, and the depraved man, and the fallen man. And as we are born, the image of the earthy, we shall also bear, now that we come to Christ, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. And that is the reason why we have all that that the Lord has revealed unto us. Look at Colossians chapter 2, reading from verse 6. Colossians chapter 2, reading from verse 6. Now he tells us that as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. You will always be going back to, you know, because of Adam, when in this condition. It says you have received Christ now, walk ye also in him. It doesn't say, you know, as you see, the life of Saul, and as you see the life of Achan, as you see the life of Samson, as you see the life of Solomon, and he did this, and he did this, so am I. It says now, you have received Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Look at verse 7. It says in verse 7 of that uh, Colossians chapter 2, it says rooted and built up. You are rooted in Christ, and you are built up in him, and established in the faith as she have been taught and abounding therein with thanksgiving. It tells us in verse 9, in verse 9 it says, For in him, in Christ, you are born again, you come to Christ and you dwell in him. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And it says, now you are complete in him. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, for ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. You are not complete in him. Dominion has come. Strength has come. Ability has come. Authority has come. And you can walk in that authority and in the place the Lord has raised you up for and go and walk in the world different from the world and learn the light of Christ and the light of the gospel, and the light of his revelation to shine forth in your life. You will be different. You can be different. You must be different. It brings us to point number three now. In point number three, we're looking at the dominion of triumphant saints through Christ. The dominion of triumphant saints through Christ. Now we have dominion through definite faith in Christ. What does that mean? There's a point in your life that maybe you are standing up, maybe you are kneeling down, whatever the posture you see, in a definite way. I manifest this face, definite face in the Lord. And I want a definite experience as a result of putting my face in the Lord at this time. And when you do that, something happens. Regeneration happens. Salvation comes. Redemption comes. And then, if you have been saved, and you come back, and you put your definite faith in Christ, sanctification will take place. The uprooting of the Adamic nature will take place. Internal cleansing. 
and total cleansing within will take place and it will give you the very nature of God himself. And then after that has happened, you can still come back and you say you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you will be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria. And then it says unto the uttermost part of the earth. When you put your definite faith in Christ, you are going to have triumph. You are going to have dominion. Dominion over what? Dominion number one over sin and all transgressions. Dominion over self and all tempers. Bad temper, quick temper, angry temper. You have dominion over self and over all tempers. Then you have dominion number three over sickness and all tribulations. This one is walking there. That one is walking there. You come to Christ and then you hold on to the power he has given you, he has given us. You have dominion over sickness and over all tribulations. Number four, over all spirits and all terror. Over all spirits and all terror. Number five, over seducers and traitors. Number six, over the scourge of tongues, over the strife of tongues, over the slanderers by tongues, you have dominion over them. Number seven, you have dominion over Satan and all his temptations. You have dominion. Give me a good amen. You have it. It will be confirmed in your life. In Jesus' name. Let's go over one by one very quickly. Number one, you have triumph. And you have dominion over sin and transgressions. Look at Romans chapter 6. We're reading from verse 14. Romans chapter 6, verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Why? Look at verse 18. In verse 18, it says... Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. That's why sin will not have dominion over you, will not have power over you, will not have imposing authority over you, because he makes you free. Look at verse 22. In verse 22 it says, But now, being made free from sin, and become servants to God, not servants to sin, not servants to Satan, not servants to society, not servants to a terrible one that compels you to do evil, not servants to a sin partner, but to become servants to God. Ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. And the end everlasting life. I pray that that dominion will be yours in a greater way than ever before in Jesus' name. Number two, over self and all tempers. Over self and all tempers. And let me read it from Proverbs chapter 16. In Proverbs chapter 16, and we're reading from verse 32. It says, He that is low to anger is better than the mighty. Look at this now. And he that ruleth a spirit, he that has power over his spirit, over self, who is not a flying at everything happening, it says, he that ruleth a spirit than he that taketh a city. You know, when those soldiers go out and they have battle against the city and they defeat that city, we say they have dominion. But it says, he that ruleth over his spirit is greater is mightier, has achieved more than he that taketh a city. It tells us in First um, Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 25. Here Paul, the apostle says, I'm that kind of man that I put everything on them. In First Corinthians chapter 9, reading from verse 25, and every man that striveth for mastery is temperate in all things. Hold on there. You see, there are people, they don't think they can have the mastery. They don't even attempt to have the mastery. They say, I'm there. It's like they are the receiving end. A temptation will come. What can I do? They are not striving for the mastery. And then the powers that be, the powers of the world will come against them. And they're just like that. And they are blown down every time. They are destroyed every time. They are defeated every time. They are not striving for the mastery. But it says, every man that striveth for the mastery 
his temporary age in all things. Now they do each to obtain a corruptible crown, but we are incorruptible. And in verse 26, he tells us, this Paul the Apostle saying that I will have the mastery, I will have dominion, I will maintain the mastery, I'll maintain the dominion. And he says, therefore, I so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But then he says in verse 27, he says, but I put, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. He says, now, what I do is I keep under my body. He says, my tongue, I keep that under. My temper, I keep that under. He says, the members of my body, I keep it under. My feelings, I keep all that under. He says, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a cast away. That's a man striving for the mastery. And that's what the Lord has called you to. That you understand, the Lord has come to give us deliverance. He has come to give us dominion. He has come to give us total redemption. And because of that, you want that to be practical in your life. Demonstrate him in your life. You strive for the mastery. And you put everything under subjection. Number three, we have dominion over sickness and all tribulation. We have dominion over sickness and all tribulation. Look at uh, First Peter chapter 2, verse 24. First Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Who is so self, bear our sins in his own body. Hold on. He bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Hold on there. Before sin came, there was no sickness. And it was sin that brought sickness. It was sin that brought suffering. It was sin that brought death. And it says now, he has borne our sin. If he has taken the sin away, he takes the consequence of sin away. And he takes the sickness away. That's why he says that we being dead to sins. I have often told you, make it personal. And I being dead to sins. I want to hear you. And I being dead to sin should live unto righteousness. Look at this. By whose stripes ye were healed. By whose stripes I was healed. By whose stripes I am healed. You are healed in Jesus' name. I say you are healed in Jesus' name. I want you to look at something in Second Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10. Second Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10. Look at this. Who delivered us. Past tense. Who delivered us. Every sickness you had before you were born again who delivered us. Every infirmity you had because you carried it from your family, it says so delivered us. Every hereditary sin that you had before you came to Christ who delivered us. Every sickness that attached itself to you because you are descendant of Adam who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver. Present tense. And does deliver. Today and doth deliver this month and doth deliver this year and doth deliver past tense. He delivered us present tense. He doth deliver. Look at this in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us in the future. He will yet deliver us. He delivered in the past. He delivers in the present. He will yet deliver us. In the future, total deliverance from sin, from sickness, from self. Everything is yours in Jesus' name. Number four, now we have dominion over evil spirit. We have dominion over evil power. Look at Luke chapter 10, reading from verse 19. Luke chapter 10, reading from verse 19. And it says, Behold, I give unto you power. What do you have today? Power. What do you have today? Dominion. What do you have today? Authority. Over every evil spirit. It says, Behold, I give you power. Look at what God has given you. And look at what Christ has given you. And look at what he has established in your life. Rather than you're looking at your body, you're looking at what is whirling there in your brain, you're looking at all the things moving around. Don't look at that. 
bring them under your feet. And he says, behold. He says, look at this. He says, believe this. He says, embrace this. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, to tread on serpents and scorpions. Where are serpents and scorpions now? Under your feet. Say, under my feet. Say that, under my feet. Now, you'll tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. No matter who that enemy is, they will not destroy your destiny. No matter who that enemy is, their power of darkness, their power of occultism will not have authority over your life in Jesus' name. Because now it gives you dominion and it gives you power, it gives you authority over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nothing shall by any means hinder you. Nothing shall by any means harm you. Nothing shall by any means stop short your life. You live your life to the full. You live to the edge of your life. And you live strong and continue strong until you see the Lord face to face in Jesus' name. He delivers us from spirits and from all terror. Look at First John chapter 5. Verse 18, 1 John chapter 5, verse 18. It says, We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, he has dominion over sin. For we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, he has dominion over self. For we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, he has dominion over sickness. And he has dominion over all the weaknesses of man. He has dominion over all the evil spirits. And he has dominion over himself. He says, he sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God, recreated again, redeemed again, transformed again, changed into the image, and is going from glory to glory again. He that is begotten of God keepeth himself. Look at this. And that wicked one touches him not. That wicked one touches him not. All his terrible things, all his oppression, all his insanity, all his evil, he will not bring upon you. He doesn't have that authority. If you resist the devil, he will flee away from you in Jesus' name. Now, we also have authority and we have triumph and we have dominion over seducers and traitors. Over seducers and traitors. I want you to look at Second Timothy chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 13. Second Timothy chapter 3. We're reading from verse 13. It says, but evil men and seducers, evil men and seducers, will wax worse and worse. They want to demonstrate their wickedness. They want to demonstrate their evil. They want to demonstrate their power. All those seducers, they want to entice you into evil and they want to compel you to submit unto them. And it says evil men and seducers, they wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Deceiving and being deceived, but they will not catch you. I said they will not catch you because it's going to give you dominion. It's going to give you authority over them in Jesus' name. Can I hear your amen? Look at Luke now. We're looking at Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, verse 25. It says in Luke chapter 11, reading there from verse 25, it says, when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. That is, the person who has been saved and the person who has been redeemed, he, the devil is out, evil powers are out, but if he's careless and he leaves that uh, place, that heart empty, that evil spirit will try to spy and will try to come back again to see if it is empty. Then it says, but look at uh, verse 26. In verse 26, it says, then he goeth, and he taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in 
and dwell there. And the last stage of that man is worse than the first. You see, when we come to Christ, we need to keep that heart for Christ. And we need to close that heart against all the evil spirits and all the evil powers. And we need to make sure that the blood of Jesus covers us every time. The power of the Lord resides there every time. And the glory the Lord has given us and the dominion the Lord has given us, that dominion remains and abides. And then you'll be strong and then you'll be able to stand in that power and that dominion in Jesus' name. And that evil sin and that evil power and that sin that used to overcome you in the past will not continue to overcome you anymore in Jesus' name. Now, we'll come to number six. We're talking about the dominion you have, the dominion I have. Do you have it? Yes, I believe you have it. We're talking about the triumph and the dominion you have over sin and all transgressions. The dominion and the, and the triumph you have over all cell and all tempers. And the dominion you have over sickness and over all, te- all, the, all the tribulations. The dominion you have over spirits and all terror. The dominion you have over seducers and traitors. Now, the dominion you have over the scourge of tongues. You see, there are people, they use their tongue, they'll slander you, they'll say some things about you so you can be depressed, so you can come down, and so that you lose your victory. But you will not lose your victory in Jesus' name. Look at this in Job chapter 5, and I'm reading from verse 21. Job chapter 5, we're reading from verse 21. It says, Thou shall be hid from the scourge of the tongue. Thou shall be hid from the scourge of the tongue. As uh, you know, people will slander, as, as people will defame, as people will blaspheme, as people will say some things about you that could have discouraged you, depressed you. God will give you the triumph and the victory and the dominion over the scourge of tongues. Neither shall thou be afraid of destruction when it cometh in verse 22. Look at verse 22. It says, as destruction and as famine, thou shalt laugh. At destruction, you will not cry. At famine, you will not mourn. And you will not weep. And you will not say, what am I going to do now? Look at this condition. You will laugh because you have the victory. You will laugh because you have the dominion. And it says, at destruction and at famine, thou shalt laugh. Neither shalt thou be afraid of the beasts of the earth. Fear will go out of your heart, out of your life completely in Jesus' name. I'm sure you are saying your amen, your corner over there. And in verse 23, in verse 23, it says, For thou shalt be in league for the stones of the field, and the beasts of the field shall be at peace with thee. When a man's ways please the Lord, even his enemy shall be at peace with him. And then in verse 24, in verse 24 it says, And thou shalt know that the tabernacle shall be in peace, and thou shalt visit thy habitation, and shall not sin. You keep your dominion, you keep your triumph, and you keep your victory every time, all the days of your life, every day of your life, victory over the scourge of tongues, over the slander of tongues, over the strife of tongues. Look at Psalm 31, verse 20. In Psalm 31, verse 20, Thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence from the pride of man. He will hide you in the secret of his presence from the pride of man. Look at this. Thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion. Look at this. From the stripe of tongues. From the slander of of tongues from the scoffers with their tongues, from the scorners of their tongues, the Lord will hide you, and the Lord will keep you, and their words and their tongue and their utterances will not bring you down, will not depress your life, will not destroy your life. 
you keep victorious, triumphant, having dominion every time in Jesus' name. Number one, you have dominion and victory over sin and all transgressions. Number two, you have dominion and you have triumph over self and all tempers. Number three, you have dominion and you have triumph over sickness and all tribulations. Number four, you have dominion over spirits and all terror. Nothing terrifies you. And you have dominion, number five, over seducers and all traitors. Number six, you have dominion over the scourge of tongues, over the strife of tongues, over the scorners of their tongues. You have dominion in every area. Number seven, now, you have dominion over Satan and all his temptations. You have dominion over Satan and all his temptations. Look at First Peter. In First Peter chapter 5, reading from verse 8 and verse 9. In First Peter chapter 5, it says in First Peter chapter 5 verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. It says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about. Why be sober? And why be vigilant? Look at this. If, for example, you are armed as a soldier, and you have all the ammunition to defeat any terrorizing person coming against you or against what you are watching over. If you are not sober, if you are not vigilant, if you are drunk, if you are careless, if you are frivolous, if you are gambling, if you are just taking things at ease, although you have the gun in your hand, although you have everything in your hand, because you are not sober, because you are drunk, you will not be able to fight and wage war effectively over that terrorizing person coming. But you must, with all the ammunition you have, with all the guns you have, and with everything that you have, the ammo of God in your life, you must be sober and vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a running lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Look at verse 9. It says in verse 9, Whom resist ye in the faith, resist steadfast in the faith. You don't resist haphazardly and carelessly and indolently and slumberingly as if you are asleep. You are barely able to stand up. Wake up and resist the devil steadfast in the faith. You cannot resist him with unbelief. You have to believe what you have. And you have to believe the triumph and the dominion and the redemption the Lord has provided for you. And it says, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Others have gone through the same thing and they overcame. And Jesus said, because I overcome ye too, you will overcome. It tells us in First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2, reading from verse 13. In First John chapter 2, reading from verse 13, it says, I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. Others overcame. You overcome. I said you overcome. It says, I'm writing to you, young men, young men in the faith. They have come to the Lord. They are abiding in the Lord. And the word of God is abiding in them. And the, and the grace of God is abiding in them. And the confidence of faith abides in them. It says, I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. Look at verse 14. In verse 14 it says, I am written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him. That is from the beginning. I am written unto you, young men, because, 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 because ye are strong. You are a child of God, because ye are strong. 
You are growing in the Lord because you are strong. You are beholding His face and you are moving on and you are being transformed from glory to glory because you are strong. You are putting on the whole armor of God and you are strong in the day of battle because you are strong. And the word of God abides in you. And ye have overcome the wicked one. Ye have overcome the wicked one. You'll be an overcomer every day, every moment, all through your lives. In Jesus' name. Look at First John chapter 4, verse 4. In First John chapter 4, reading from verse 4, it says, Ye have got little children and have overcome them. Ye have got little children and have overcome them. You are born again. You have God. You are saved. You have God. You are redeemed. You have God. You are cleansed. You have God. You are brought into the kingdom of God. You have God. You have let your sin. You have left the past and you are holding on to the Lord. It says you have got little children and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And that greater one will manifest his dominion, his power over your life in Jesus' name. You are an overcomer. I am an overcomer. I can I hear you? I am an overcomer. You'll be an overcomer in Jesus' name. I want you to look at uh, the word of God now in Romans chapter 8 verse 37. Romans chapter 8, we're looking at verse 37. It's telling us, it says me, in all these things, temptation, in all these things, all the transgressions, in all these things, all the temptations, in all these things, all the strife of tongues, in all these things, all the traitors, in all these things, all the terrible things that might happen, it says me, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Through him that loved us. Through him that loved us. You'll be an overcomer. You're already an overcomer. And the power and the grace and the strength that overcomes the Lord puts in your life more and more ever in Jesus' name. As I come to a conclusion, I'm going to read that verse of scripture again that we read before in Second Corinthians chapter 3. Second Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 18, and he's saying, but we all, don't count yourself out. You are there now. You are a child of God. You are born again, but we all. You are redeemed. You are saved, but we all. You are sanctified, and the depravity is taken away from you, but we all. You are a child of God, and the power of the Spirit of God is upon your life. And he says, and we all, with open face, with open face, you are not looking down. You're not closing your eyes. And when you see things happening that might tell you, you don't dodge. You don't turn your face another way with open face, beholding as in a glass. Beholding the Lord as in a glass. It's like you can see the Lord. You can see the invisible one beholding as in a glass. The glory of the Lord, the glory of the Lord, see him that brings us to glory and see him that brings us to all power. It says we are changed into the same image from glory to glory, from glory to glory, from strength to strength, from power to power, from deliverance to deliverance, from dominion to dominion, from triumph unto triumph. It says we are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Even as by the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord is right there with you. As you are listening to the Word of God right now. It's very close by. He wants to make of you a new man. He wants to make of you a new creature. Bold and authoritative and having dominion and triumphant. He wants to make of you a different man that is confident and whatever the enemy and whatever the challenge, starting from sin to self to sickness to evil spirits to seducers to the scourge of the scorners and to Satan himself, he gives you the victory. Transformation time has come. 
upliftment time has come. The Lord is going to do great things in your life, in your heart, in your spirit, in your soul. It's going to transform you to be another man, even from now on, having dominion of the triumphant saints through Christ. Why don't you rise up and say, Lord, I thank you for the revelation of your word unto me today. A recreation can happen right now. And a redemption can happen right now that you have never seen. A reformation, a transmission can happen now that you have never experienced. Forget everything around you and look up to God and you can have dominion restored unto you. What we lost in Adam, you can regain today. What we lost in Adam, you can have restored today. You can rediscover today and come to realization in your life today. Any sin there, open up to the Lord, confess it to the Lord, and turn away from it and say, Lord, here I am. I open up my heart, I open up my life, I open up my past, I open up my present, I open up everything about my life unto you. And then his cleansing hand will come, his redeeming hand will come, his recreating hand will come, his transforming hand will come. It will transform you, it will transform you. And it can take place right now in a moment of time. Tell the Lord, tell the Lord. Salvation is very important. Except a man be born again, he cannot see, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He cannot enter into this dominion of the kingdom, into this power of the kingdom, into this triumph of the kingdom. A man must be born again. You must be turned around and your life must be turned around. Tell the Lord, and if you are saved and you are sure, and the Spirit of God is bearing witness with your heart that you are born again, that you are a child of God, that you are redeemed of the Lord, you can go a step further and consecrate me everything on the altar. I want to be like Christ. I want to be like my Savior. I want to be like the Redeemer. I want to be like the King in dominion. I want to be like the one that was never conquered by any tempter and by any temptation. I want to be totally, fully, completely like him as he is. So I want to be right in this world, in my inner man, in my spirit, in my soul, in my mind. I want to have the mind of Christ. Lay everything on the altar and consecrate everything to the Lord. The Lord will do it. The Lord will do it. Is the one who sanctifies, he that sanctifies, and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause is not ashamed to call them brethren. You come closer to him in a closer relationship. You come closer to him in a more intimate relationship as you get sanctified. And if you're sanctified and the Spirit of God is bearing witness with your heart, you're saved, you're sanctified, you're purified, you're made holy. You are made godly and the inner man has been turned around. You are totally, fully transformed. And now the Lord is bringing you from glory unto glory. You can have the power of the Holy Ghost as well in your life. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But greater is he that is among you that will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Because John did baptize with water. But he shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days since. And he shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And he shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. You can have that power. You can have peace with God, salvation. You can have purity in Christ, sanctification. You can have the power of the Holy Ghost. That's Holy Ghost baptism, and you can have triumph. You can have dominion. He can do that for you. Ask in faith, nothing wavering. Ask in faith, nothing wavering. There will be a recreation. There will be a dominion. And then, after the service, with that dominion, with that triumph, with that overcoming power, you go out in the strength of the Lord, and all those things that used to conquer you, they'll be under your feet in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this hour. We thank you for this moment. We thank you, Lord, because you have revealed to us today as a child of God, even babes in Christ, we can have dominion. 
we can have victory. We can have triumph. And we pray, Lord, all the dominion, all the victory, all the triumph that a child of God ought to have because of Calvary and because of redemption that is accomplished in Christ and through Christ, give to everyone in Jesus' name and move your people forward to sanctification, real sanctification, experiential sanctification that really purges the heart, purifies the heart, and that gives us Christ sitting on the throne of our hearts and leading us and we're living by him so that, Lord, the dominion of the sanctified, the triumph of the sanctified, and the victory of the sanctified, you grant to everyone in Jesus' name and those who are saved and those who are sanctified and we need the power of God, the power of the Holy Ghost. Lord, we're asking that you fill your people with power. I pray, Lord, you energize your people with power. Pour out the power, the endowment of the Holy Ghost upon every sanctified vessel. In Jesus' name, O oh Lord, we'll pray as a church. We'll stand up as a militant congregation, a militant assembly, a triumphant congregation, a congregation having dominion, and everywhere we are, in every village, every town, every city, every community, this triumph and this dominion of the righteous, of the redeemed, you give unto every one of us and every congregation in Jesus' name that sin will not have dominion over any of us as individuals, as families, as local churches, as the whole church, in Jesus' name, that self will not have dominion over us, that sickness will not have dominion over us, that evil spirits will not have dominion over us, and that corners and scoffers and the scourge of tongues will not have dominion over us, that seducers will not have dominion over us, and more importantly, that Satan will not have dominion over your church in Jesus' name. On this rock you said, I built my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail over that church. And you've given us the key of the kingdom, that whatever we bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever we lose on earth is loosed in heaven. We pray, Lord, everyone will enjoy that dominion, that triumph to the full in Jesus' name. And as a church together, united was time. Every one of us corporately will enjoy that dominion, that triumph in Jesus' and testimonies will be coming from everywhere that all who are connected with this church directly in congregation or online, every one of us will have the dominion. Confirm it in every life, Lord. Confirm it in every family, Lord. Confirm it in every community, Lord. Confirm it in every local church. Confirm it in the church at large. In Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. And God keep you in triumph, in dominion, always overcoming every time in Jesus' name.